Why? What is that? That, that? that feeling? What is happening? It's hard to talk about fantasy without Lord of the Rings. If you didn't read the books, you probably saw the movies. They're all great, but some characters are radically changed for drama, some events were reworked, and other little things like that that might not be a perfect experience for a book purist. It's fairly well known that Tolkien's son Christopher hates these movies. He doesn't like the fact that they're action films and generally the whole commercialization of his dad's work. I've gotta say, if he was bothered that much by those, he would probably have a heart attack if he saw what else was out there. Games like The Third Age took, uh, quite a few liberties? Quite a few? Regardless, there were some really good licensed games based off of the movies. Most were fun and quality, though there were some odd ones. But for the most part, they were all based off the New Line Cinema movies. For the most part, there were the others. Back then, Electronic Arts had exclusive right to all the movie games, but Tolkien Enterprises could still make games based off the original work. This is one of those games. I found my copy on accident. I was looking for Empire Earth Discs. So I was curious about what people said about it over the years, but I could barely find a thing on it online. You can't buy it digitally anywhere. If you look up Lord of the Rings RTS, 90% of the results will be about Battle for Middle Earth. Which makes sense, because it's a good series. To make things even harder, there's also a tabletop game called War of the Ring. So then I felt like I had a duty to tell people about this. War of the Ring is bizarre for a Balrog shit pile of reasons, so let's get right into it. The main menu in my game has a bunch of orcs in it. This might be because I bought the evil edition, but I'm not sure. When this was sold in stores, it had two copies. One was the good edition, which showed this elf holding an orc head, but there was an evil edition that was the opposite. That's what I have. So is there an alternate main menu filled with elves and trees and shit? I don't know, but I can't find a picture of one. I have bigger problems anyways because the update server is down. A patch could be what adds widescreen to the game. Otherwise, looking at the game feels like being him. I got it after a lot of searching. This added more resolutions, but no 1080. I did get it working eventually using some tricks. If I don't run the game in admin mode, it won't save my games, so I gotta be careful. It also messed up the loading graphic, but that's not a huge deal to me. I'd rather see more of the game map than be really scrunched in. Keep in mind, I do think this is serviceable without tweaks, but if I can find a better way, I'll do it. Now's a good time to look at the graphics in general. I usually try to separate the art style from the technical graphics, but this time I'm gonna go into the art style first. Because if you played another RTS game, this might seem a little familiar. Let's not beat around the bush. The game looks very similar to Battle Realms. We're gonna need a lot more rice to push the Western Devil from our lands. That's what this game's all about. Okay, I have some explaining to do. Battle Realms was the first game that Liquid Entertainment made, with War of the Ring being the second. It also came out nearly eight months before Warcraft 3. So was it a ripoff? Well, the very first public images of Warcraft 3 had the same kind of art style going on, so probably not. They just ended up going in the same direction. Yeah, the art style is similar and they both have the same cinematic cutscenes, but the gameplay could not be more different. Warcraft 3 was generally more traditional, and Battle Realms is about transforming worker units. So artistically, it's kind of hard to call War of the Ring a complete Warcraft 3 ripoff. But that's purely for art style. The elves of this wood, they will surely help us. Then let us make haste. It was clearly influenced by Warcraft 3 in a lot of other ways, but I'll come back to that later. That business aside, I'd say it's pretty gorgeous for an RTS game. It has a lot of good lighting, and some of the levels are really atmospheric. Just look at that burning enemy base. That's some quality. If a building is training units or researching, they have neat little animations. On top of that, buildings have different models for damage levels. This is a lot of effort. Though I have to mention something I found really unusual about this. This might be the goriest Lord of the Rings game made before Shadow of Mordor. I'm talking about more than blood splatters. I'm talking about enemies sometimes exploding into organs and bones like you're playing a Fallout game. That's pretty graphic for 2002. I don't know, a T just looks a little bit light for that image. You can also toggle the gore in the menu, and Battle Realms has this too. Was this how you got past the ratings board? I mean, I prefer this to buying the gore. I just think it's funny that either this slipped past the censors, or it made the game okay to sell to underage people. So on a technical level, it's really impressive. It has more grass than Bonnaroo, but when I look at the art style, I start seeing some issues. The really cartoony art style doesn't feel like it fits in with the source material. If you compare locations in the Bakshi movies to the Peter Jackson films, you'll notice a lot of similarities. This is because Tolkien was a very detailed writer, so throwing that out the window for a mostly generic fantasy look feels like a loss. A lot of the fantasy units look great and were clearly inspired by the Bakshi animation, but some things strike me as odd. It was like there was a mandate that every unit had to be an over-the-top fantasy character. Now it could be that my eyes were just spoiled by the movies, but the books were written in a really detailed and grounded way. Like the setting was supposed to be an ancient fictional history. Having the entire look be really exaggerated kind of takes away from all that. I'm probably nitpicking, it just seems too generic for the source. But then there's the sound. 
War of the Ring has some great voice acting. Our buildings can only be built on this corrupted land. That, half-wit, is why you need a slave master! Good idea, master. I saw him approach some time ago. Ah! You're still here? Target practice. That sounds like the devil. I think they gave the voice actors for the evil side a lot more freedom to interpret their role. The narrator sounds like an evil wizard. The Dark Lord's forces are pressing into Roham. With their supplies steadily dwindling, Grishnok is ordered to send more slaves to work their camps. There are some great performances from some pretty prominent voice actors in this. I didn't notice any stock sounds either, which was a problem in some RTS games. But the big thing is the music. A lot of the maps in the game have unique tracks of music for each side. During editing, I found out they can complement each other. Let's take a listen. While a lot of it is generic, there are some really great tracks in here. The copies on YouTube aren't in great quality, but I found out why. They're packed up in an H2O file that only this game and Battle Realms uses, so I went on one of those forum adventures. Eventually got an unpacker working to save the music, and then it turned out it was already rescued on Proto Man. So that was precious time wasted, but you can find the soundtrack online if you're interested. Despite my issues with it, overall I think the game has a pretty excellent presentation. You'd think something this obscure would be really cheap quality, but it's not. If I stopped here it would look like an underrated gem, but this is a video game. So now I'm finally gonna get into the gameplay. Your main source of fun will be the campaigns. I'm gonna start with the one for the good side. If I just said good campaign, you might be confused. The first mission has you playing as dwarves retaking the Iron Hills. I was already running into a few issues. You might have noticed I'm having to drag the mouse around to pan. For whatever reason, the arrow keys are what you use to scroll. I tried rebinding them, but the game doesn't seem to understand. That's annoying, but not a deal breaker. Your main mission is to go dump rocks on the enemy orcs. It's nothing too crazy for an RTS game. You research tech and pump out units. You only need to worry about two resources, food and ore. The same thing goes for the evil side. Each deposit is very limited, so it's important to have good map control. War of the Ring attempts to mix things up with fate points. They're generated by having units in combat, and they're pretty useful. The more powerful hero units will require fate points to unlock. You can also use them to buy powerful hero abilities. You know, like, the Ring of Power. It's only a unit cloak in this game. A lot of these abilities are exceptionally powerful, and they carry through the campaign. Heroes level up to gain stat bonuses, but not any new abilities. Those are for the fate points. But that's not all they can do. Both sides have different powers to harm their enemies or buff their own troops. If you spend a lot of points, you could summon a big dick unit like an Ent or a Balrog, but they have a limited lifespan. These can really turn the tide in a fight, so it's usually a good idea to have some saved for if things get harsh. It's an improvement over the similar system that was in Battle Realms. I think this could encourage the biggest turtles to fight a little bit, just to get some of these fate points. There's one the good side has that buffs one of your heroes but makes them unable to be respawned. This is good for those missions where if the hero dies, you lose. I wish the evil side had this. Yes, my stuff has been defeated. There will be no man's flesh today. Looks like meat's off the menu. That's what happens when I don't micro war riders to get more fate points. Points. Hero abilities operate strictly off cooldowns, no mana or magic or anything like that. They're also much simpler compared to Warcraft 3 hero units. Most can be maxed out in the mission you get them in. Getting back on track, the second dwarf mission is where I scratched my head. Gimli is searching for Thorn Oakenshield's ancient WMD. You need to see this. Tales with orc blood, as a warning to others who would invade our lands. <laughs> Wonderful to see you, Gandalf! <laughs> <laughs> Didn't 
you got Mr. Uncle Bilbo's birth. <laughs> so the estate says that these movies are a travesty. To that I say, someone there approved the orc genocide. This was licensed by the estate, so maybe they should have been looking more at these. That thing should basically be a war crime. I would say Gimli should probably go on trial, but his height is probably punishment enough. This is bizarre to me. You would think that the estate would try to keep things closer to the books, but no, it deviates more than the movies. Does anyone remember Selim? She's the leader of the Haradrim and dual wield scimitars. It appears that I have arrived just in time. I don't remember the part where they took over Rohan either. So if you were hoping this game would at least be a really good book adaptation, then no, that's not here either. Eventually you get to pick between which mission to do next. It's quickly becoming apparent that just having two factions really hurt the game. It makes the racial missions feel limited because you're missing core parts of your army. It doesn't help that the story to push you forward is really bland. Plus, a lot of the cutscenes are... janky. Like even in the orc war crime earlier, it feels like the timing for the events are just a little bit off. They may not have had enough time to clean them up more. Overall, the good campaign just feels very generic. The game also has a big problem with stealth units. I'm getting really bad flashbacks. In a normal RTS game, a stealth unit is like a scout or maybe a glass cannon. But in this, the archers are beefy and they dump out damage. You can't go wrong spamming them. You just wrap the detector unit and you win. Towers can't stop you either because they don't have stealth detection. This goes for both sides too. You have to garrison a wraith if you're playing as the evil side, or a ranger if you're in the forces of good. It's the same thing for the evil side because their slayers have the best DPS. I really wish they gave them faction names because saying side all the time really doesn't roll off the tongue. The problem is enemies spawn endlessly in some missions, so you want to do this. You have a limited economy. Meanwhile, Gothmog is tapping into a goddamn Dyson Sphere. Was this in the Silmarillion? It's frustrating, and this is on every difficulty. The only thing it does is buff enemy unit stats. If you don't use the Cloak Boys, you could be grinded down in a war of attrition. The campaign also starts having some bizarre design decisions. I thought Helm's Deep would be a pure combat mission, which it was, but they reoriented the camera so it doesn't match up with the minimap. This is for a defense mission where you need to guard certain walls. This makes that a lot more confusing. It says you can reorient it, but the button doesn't do anything. This level reveals a lot of problems in the game's combat systems. RTS games that came out years before this had unit stances. Commands like a patrol order work, but others are a little finicky. Including a patrol order, you have three stances. You'd think you'd have a stand ground option for archers, but no, you have to guard an area. If you do this on anything other than flat ground, you're gonna have problems. Where are you going? Why won't this work? The in-game hold position just makes your units stand there not attacking. I thought video games decided that's not what hold position means. Why does it work this way? The game already has pathfinding issues. I can accept that. But standing and shooting being unreliable is ridiculous. But it gets worse, because an archer can shoot even if something's in the way. Thunk. Thunk. So your wall archers can easily be hitting nothing. Someone throw me in the river already. You could choose to do a different mission first instead. There's a lot more going on here. There are spawning patrols of endgame units who want to crush your base. But the worst part are the ring wraiths. They have a power where they can teleport on corrupted land. That's already pretty spooky. So naturally this map has tons of respawning ones, and they can pop in at any time. It never ends. That's harsh enough. But then you have goblin masters constantly running into your base trying to light a mud sign over them. Oh god, he made it. Jesus Christ. Some of these missions are obnoxious, but none get as bad as that ever again. I played this campaign to the very end on hard. I didn't feel super challenged by a lot of it, just kind of annoyed. So I won the map outside Mordor. What's next? The might of the Dark Lord had been countered. Gondor steel bested orc blades and the blood of Sauron's minions. Well, the epic conclusion to the saga is a voiceover during the credits. I didn't expect a lot, but that's kind of disappointing. Let's check out the dark side. Your first task is getting goblin workers through a maze because the old camp ate all of theirs. I already found myself a bit more invested in this. They can only construct their buildings on corrupted land, which the slave masters make as we saw earlier. The forces of good need to build houses to increase their population, but evil just builds more slave masters. You might think they feel bigger armies, but no. Most of their basic units cost three population points or whatever they are. Really cheap and bad spearmen are one, so I found myself having population issues a lot more. This mission didn't have respawning enemies, it just had a lot of them. I decided to stop playing on hard after this one. By the end, I had no food and had to spam slave masters to try and get through it. They're even weaker than spearmen, so this wasn't ideal. Fucking slaves, get your ass back here! I was also starting to see really blatant bugs. Their upper halves are just gone. It's only this one group of enemies in the level, and then I never see this problem again. When you make it to the end of the level, they just eat the new workers. Just in time for dinner. <laughs> to be fair, that's consistent. Nothing really stood out to me in these early campaign missions. Their commander does have a funny run, but it's not as good as Legolas Prancing. But I ended up getting a game-breaking bug in one of the later missions, and I don't mean Shalab. Saruman is fusing ghosts and orcs to make Urukai. 
I don't know if it worked exactly that way. Anyways, you need to move a wraith and an orc on a sacrificial pit. So I move an orc there and I can't use him anymore, but when I move the wraith there, nothing happens. The game is stuck, I can't progress. So I restart the mission and put the ghost on first. Then I put the orc on and it works perfectly. I was confused. Why did the reverse order lock me out of my game before? I was really scratching my head until I looked at the objective menu. Oh, the ghost objective is on top, so if I put the orc on first, I lose. This game is a mystery. Despite this, I find the evil campaign a lot more fun to play. I thought their units and abilities were interesting. For example, the Witch King can use fate points to turn wraiths into Nazgul. Yeah. There were significantly less maps that had endless swarms of enemies. I guess this is because narratively you're supposed to be the evil swarm now. At the same time, it's still nothing exceptional. It's still really cookie cutter for other games of its time. Even though it's a prequel to the saga, it still isn't very interesting. Right when you think the story is built up to something, the same thing happens as the good campaign. While the Dark Lord gazed upon another stronghold of the free peoples of Middle-earth. No thank you. Despite all the maps, the skirmish games aren't very interesting either. The most standout kind was Catapult. It's a spin on Capture the Flag where you try to control the War Crime Siege engine, but it's not that good. It doesn't surprise me that this didn't last long in multiplayer, especially when you compare it to the vibrant Warcraft 3 modding scene. Looking at all this, it's no surprise the game got buried. Battle for Middle-earth came out less than four months later. I think that's a much better game in about every way, and most people would agree with me. If War of the Ring was an underrated gem, or maybe a really funny bad game, it would be talked about more. But it's neither of those. It's an okay game. People remember great games or really bad games, but things like this, it's easy to forget. It's not the worst game I ever played. I've played plenty of RTS titles with more issues. It's a Warcraft 3 remix, not really much more or much less than that. If they had risked a little more in the gameplay mechanics, it could have been a classic. Right now it's Legacy, if anyone will remember it, will be a generic game that had a really special license. But for me, it left some memories that will never go away, and I'll truly treasure the time I did spend with this game. Actually, I saw it in a magazine in 2003 and thought it'd be good and I was wrong. This game tricked you into buying it. I hear them, precious. That's not Andy Circus. The false hype train ruined me. But more people will know about it now, and that's something. Thank you for taking this magical journey with me. I'm still taking game requests, even though the list is getting pretty big. I appreciate them, and I try to get back to you when I have a chance. Also, thank you for all the fan art. This is really high quality and humbling, so thank you. Every piece is appreciated. I'll see you in the next video when I discuss robot pricing.